hard. Also for me, but <laughs> at the end I had it. I asked it for cassoulet one day. They decided, well, you want cassoulet, you will have cassoulet. And uh, then uh, uh, the, the research I'm going to present you here has been, has been developed during some years. I am sitting here because uh, you have never gave a talk in this position behind the yellow of the body. Then I am not too tall, then I prefer to be here. <laughs> Just to gain some height, and sometimes I will do this. And there. <clears throat> Este, uh, what are we going to talk about? I'm going to present you a general method, which in my opinion is very simple, very easy to compute, very reasonable. Every property you, can, uh, you want to add here, it is fulfilled. <laughs> okay. You are a mathematician. You know mathematicians, they do things like this. And then, here there is some trick. It is not possible. You, you are losing something. What I am losing here? What I am losing here is that the, my method I'm going to present you is for sure. This is not a theorem, but you will see from the method I am right. This method is optimum under absolutely no circumstance. I can guarantee this for you. This is surprising because I am a mathematician. Most of you are mathematicians. When a mathematician starts to work in a statistical program, you introduce a new procedure which is very good, optimal, under those specific circumstances, and then you include in your paper some very nice simulation showing that this is optimal under those circumstances, but not so bad in the others. And here I am in the opposite. What, how is this possible? I, I taken the philosophy by, from this paper by hand in 2006, and then I can, uh, I can give you an explanation of this philosophy. When I finish, or before, if no, nobody knows, you leave this room, then you go to the street, you go, uh, easily along the sidewalk, okay? Then uh, a public bus came in the opposite direction, a regular public bus. What is your reaction? Of course, you start running very quickly to, to hide behind a tree and phone the police because perhaps there is a, 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 a very dangerous murder driving the bus going to hit you. No, this, nothing hap this practically never happens. Sometimes happen. Now, Translate this, this is what, how you act in the, in the regular life. But what in mathematics? In mathematics, you, you find a very specific procedure, very good to protect you against what? Data, regular data in the life are like regular buses. Data doesn't come against you. They are there. And probably not taking special care, very, book, very big powers, very, I don't know what, procedures, you will discover what is behind the power, behind the data. And this is this philosophy. Of course, there are some crazy <laughs> bus drivers and there are some police stations and police stations are needed. And of course, there are difficult data sets which uh, to handle them, you need to have a specific, very, spe uh, very specific procedure to find the truth on this. So I'm not against the specific procedures. I, the only thing is today I am presenting a procedure which works in most of circumstances around the life. Okay, next. <clears throat> uh, I don't know which people is here. Perhaps there is somebody which doesn't know what is functional data analysis. And then data, functional data analysis is a statistical. Thing. You have here the picture very clear. <laughs> then what is, what, uh, are you worried now? Yeah. <laughs> Already, wait a minute. <laughs> Therefore, what is uh, functional data analysis uh, in statistics? Are statistical techniques to handle procedures in which the data to handle problems in which the data are functions. For instance, you have here the mean daily temperatures in Spanish weather stations. So, you have for each station a curve which is a function somewhere. Then you have here a data set very popular which is called the theta the Cator data set. In the uh, axis axis you have. Uh, the wavelength of some radiation, and then you have the absorbance, and the color is related to the, the fat content of the meat. This, those are samples of meat, each curve corresponds to each one, and we can assume that this is continuous, and then for each sample, for each if, if, uh, uh, piece of meat, you have a function. Very good. So we are going to handle those data. Uh, so we are, we are going to have a, most time we are going to have a sample of a ID data, as always, with the important characteristic that our data are going to be functions. Very good. 
And then uh, we can assume that our functions are defined in one, in one interval. I, please allow me to take the interval 0, 1. I need some mathematical assumptions because if not, I, I'm going to do nothing. And my mathematical assumption is that uh, this integral is finite. This is not too big assumption. If the function is continuous, then it is bounded, so it is integrable. And this allows me to introduce a Hilbert space structure in which uh, uh, I, handle, I am handling the space of the function with finite integral. This is the scalar product, the integral of the product. And then you have this norm. Very well. Now, let's go to, the, to business. How many one-dimensional marginals are required to determine a probability measure? Let me present you this problem more specifically. Do you hear me okay? Yeah. Very good. Now, we are in R2 here, and I have two probability distributions, probability P and probability Q. Then we select a one-dimensional marginal, for instance this. Okay, you see this? And then I tell you, hey, look, 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 look. The marginal of P in this direction is a standard normal. And the marginal of Q is also a standard normal. Only with this information. Can you tell me for sure? Oh, yes, then P and Q are the same. Of course, no. Yo, then, I am talking to you about how many. Well, 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 well. Then, I want, you to, I want to give you more information. I take the second marginal. And then it happens that the marginal of P, the marginal of Q, is this enough information for you? No, okay, very good. And then I take another one. Is this, this is the problem I, want to, I am telling you. How many one-dimensional marginals come of course, if I take this and this, the marginals are different, P and Q are different. But there are, how many one-dimensional one marginals do you need? I don't know. Okay, you, perhaps you need infinite, I don't know, you seem to have to need infinite. Therefore, there are some results uh, according to this question. You know the kramer wolf theorem which, uh, in 1936, which states that if all of them are the same, then the probability distribution are the same. Very good. There are some, gener some generalizations, uh, not too new. Uh, here there are on, on R2, and here on finite one-dimensional projection determine P if the support is bounded, if P is determined by their moments. Then you have here more recent results in the, on RD related to the D minus one dimensional projections. And uh, this result is important in the sense that uh, here you see P is determined by their moments, P is determined. The question is that some condition of P is required. In this paper, a PR counter example, a PR counter example in which you have two distributions with no moments and uh, two dimensionals. And a big angle, I don't remember, uh, P over six or something like this, and all marginal in this area are common and the distribution is different. So the results are related to R2, you see what you thought, unfinite, unfinite. I need unfinite, two, three, four is not enough. I need unfinite, okay. Uh, okay, I need some notation. Uh, then I have a probability, uh, L2, R2, it doesn't matter, a probability. And then I compute marginals. What is a marginal? I select a direction, this or this, I compute the, mar the marginal distribution of P in this direction. V gives you the direction, and P uh, sub V gives you the marginal. Very good. And this is the important set. I have, you have two distributions, P, the right one, Q, the left one, for me, and then uh, you have the number of the sets of vectors such that the marginals are the same. So my previous question for you is, how many elements do you need here in order to be sure that P is equal to Q? This is the, main, the first main question. Very good. How many? Uh, okay, that's what I was telling you. And now I'm going to present you, this is the best moment in my talk. Okay? <laughs> this is just to be, you to be ready. <laughs> I, am, I, am, I am trying to find a sponsor to introduce here an advertisement, but I didn't find <laughs> And then, uh, okay, Danone is presenting you the answer. <laughs> and therefore, <clears throat> uh, the general answer in Hilbert space, then I'm going to present you the answer. What is the answer? Just one dimension, one, just one, one dimensional projection suffices. 
White, 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 white. Just one. But before you told me, I told you, I agree with you that one is not enough. Now I am telling you that one is enough. How is this possible? Think. I told you, I have this marginal in common. Is this enough? Your answer was no. Why? Because you know how to construct a counterexample. If I gave you this marginal, then you know how to construct a counterexample. You know how to construct P and Q with this marginal in common. This situation is different. P and Q are given. They may have some one-dimensional marginal in common. But how many? Of course, one, two, three, you know how to construct the sample. But how many? Not so many, very few. So few that if you choose the marginal at random, you close your, close your right side, then the probability to obtain, P and Q are different. The probability to obtain a marginal with the same, uh, sorry, a direction given the same marginal is zero. This is the difference. If I gave you the marginal first, then you know how to construct the counter example. You know how to find a crazy driver for the bus to, to trap me. If I tell you where I'm going to be. But if I take the, the, drive, the, the bus, the probability that the driver is crazy against me is zero. OK? This is the same situation. OK. And this, is, this result holds in general Hilbert spaces. Uh, here you have the result. And then I need a condition on the moments, I tell you. Then I have two probability different. And then the probability to find at random uh, a marginal in common is zero. Here uh, I need some condition on mu. Mu need to be continuous. What does exactly mean continuous? It doesn't matter. It is not important. But uh, for the time being, uh, it is enough if, if I am in the uh, in RD, then Absolute continuity with respect to the Lebesgue measure is enough. If I am in generalized spaces, the, of course, I can, I can take here not Gaussian distribution, but uh, I don't want to go in technical details. Then if you take a Gaussian distribution with non-degenerate one-dimensional marginals, the result holds. Very good. This result is probability. I mean, this is a, uh, this is a characterization of I don't know what, the probabilistic result. But here, uh, sorry, they can be extended to Banach space. This was done in 2009. What is the interest for analysis? Here, this is a statistical meeting, if, if I understood properly the French. But uh, then I need to obtain some, some, some statistical application of this result. This result can be applied in many testing programs. For instance, assume that you have two samples, x and y. Uh, of functions. Those are functions or points. The, the, you, you can choose. Those are functions. Then the new hypothesis is this. The distribution who generated x is the same as the distribution who generated y. Very good. How can you contest this new hypothesis? Simply, select v at random using this distribution you have here. You have, so you close the, your eyes and take the, the direction. Very good. Then, Project your sample in this direction. Take your, you have your point here. Take this direction, project them. What is this? This is a sample taken from the projection of this distribution on the subspace generated by V. What is this? A random sample taken from the projection of this distribution in the subspace generated by V. Very good. And now my only problem consists on Testing whether P projected on B coincides with P projected on V. Why? Because according with the previous, pro, uh, previous result, if they are different, the marginal are going to be different with probability 1. Therefore, it is equivalent to test this new hypothesis, where is it? This new hypothesis than the corresponding one on the marginals. I have a sample of the marginals, and then I can use, for instance, the kolmogorov smirnov uh, test to do this. And that's it. Very simple. I told you, this process is very simple, very flexible. What, uh, have, have you won something? Yes. You have a problem testing the quality of, those, of two distributions in a functional spaces 
this problem has been replaced by testing the quality of two distributions in R. How many homogeneity tests do you know in functional spaces? How many tests do you know in R? One to one, two thousand. So you, are, you have one flexibility. You have more, te more, more spaces, more tests to handle. What's the price you have paid? Every time I tell the students, nobody's going to give you for free. Nothing, anything. So you have paid something. What is the price you have paid? You have replaced, sorry, you have replaced a function by a real number. So you probably you are going to lose some power. This is what I told you. This procedure is optimal under no circumstance at all. Very good. Now, oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. This is a very nice theoretical result. Very good, but I don't know what, but uh, how do I choose V in practice? Of course, in theory, in theory you, I can handle here I don't know, a diffusion, distribution, I, I don't know what, and you choose V. But in practice, in practice, how do you choose V in practice? I am interested in this. Well, I will be interested if I were there. Expecting, <laughs> expecting I'm, going to say, I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer the question and think myself. How? I, if, of course, this result holds in, dimen in the in finite dimensional situation. In finite dimensional situation, I hope you have no problem. You can take uh, from a standard normal distribution and that's it. Very good. Functional case, how can I select a function? B is a function. A function at random with a Gaussian distribution. Wait a minute. From a theoretical or from a practical point of view? Theoretical, no problem. No, I won't, I am interested in a practical, you should be interested in a practical point of view. Very good, practical, okay, practice. In practice, we are talking about reality. In reality, you don't have a function. The, your function is measured in a finite number of points. Perhaps a big number of points, but finite. So, no problem. You can take the same, you can use the same the result as before, and then multiply by appropriate matrix to obtain the, the covariance structure you want, or I don't know what. Ah, do you don't like this result? You can take advantage of some property of the distribution you are handling. For instance, assume uh, you want to take the vector with the distribution of a standard Brownian motion. This is very simple. Take uh, a, a ID, uh, D, a ID, normal zero one distributions, where D is the number of points in which uh, your data has been measured. Then the, the standard volume motion always starts at zero. It has uh, now, uh, so, so you start at zero, and then you, you go here. This, the value here is the value in the previous point plus the increment. You know that the Brownian motion has independent increments, so those functions are increments, and the variance is <coughs> this value, so that's it. It is very simple. It takes nothing. So uh, you feel disappointed. You have to, you, have, you, you should, you have like it. I, I have no answer for your question. Eh? <laughs> now, you have, here you have an example of application of the theory I told you before. And then it is related to proteomics. Here in proteomics, we analyze molecules, molecules with respect to the rate mass charge. Here we, uh, I am going to analyze 95 spectrograms from healthy woman and 121 from women suffering from ovarian cancer. Here you have the ratio of mass charge, and here you have the number of proteins. For instance, this is 600. There are some zeros here, one, two, three. You see differences between this and this. Very good. And then, uh, uh, in fact, the data are in dimension 15,000, roughly speaking. And the idea is that uh, ill cells produce different kinds of proteins than those produced by healthy cells. What, uh, what I'm going to do? I'm going to do the following. ¿Qué ha pasado? Ah, no, va bien. Uh, what I'm going to do? First, I'm going to choose v, uh, uh, the, the direction, the function, with uh, a standard Brownian motion distribution in which I am taking T0 equal to zero. I am rescaling my interval. There's no problem with this, I hope. Second, uh, I compute the projections of the spectrograms on this one-dimensional space. Remember, the, the projection is computed, uh, computing integrals of products. I have only a finite number of points, 50,000, but finite. So I replace integrals by sums with times the increments. 
this is definition of the Lebesgue integral, no problem. And then the analysis starts. I split the healthy woman in two groups at random. I split the healed woman in two groups at random. And I am checking the green and red hypothesis. Green is samples, distribution who generate the samples of healthy are the same. This new hypothesis holds because they were taken at random from the same pool. The same with the other with respect to the, the cancer th woman. And then the red one is when I compare a sample from healthy against a sample with, with cancer guy, girls. I have repeated this procedure 1,000 times. Along 1,000 times, I expect green new hypothesis should be rejected 5% of the time because this is the level of the test. And the mean of the p-value should be around one half. However, red new hypothesis, if it is uh, the, the assumption that ill cells produce different proteins than healthy cells, so the red uh, assumption, the red hypothesis, should be rejected an high proportion of times with very low p-values. And what is the result? Of course, what that, uh, is good, because if not, I will not be here. Telling that I will have found a different example. You have that the p-value, the proportion of rejection of green new hypothesis is around 0.05, the mean of the p-value is around 0.5, and the red hypothesis has been rejected 95% of times with mean of p-values around 0.01. This is what I told you from the beginning. Those are regular data. Those data are not crazy drivers, no, regular data. And then the model works. That's it. Uh, and now, from this point on, I only, going, I only have to present you several examples to, uh, in which you can apply our method. First one is related to the factor, uh, functional analysis of variance uh, in two ways. Very good. Uh, if you are interested in functional data analysis, you know that there are several possibilities to handle the ANOVA, ANOVA data. Here, I'm going to present you a very general, you can handle every model you can imagine, very simple. How? Here I am focusing in two ways. We are in two ways, so we have two factors with a finite number of levels. The whole, the, the, then we have some measurements. Remember, those are functions. Those are functions. For every level of the first factor, for every level of the second factor, I have a sample of functions. Very good. What is the model? I need a linear model. The linear model is exactly the same as in the one-dimensional case. I mean... I have an observation. In the one-dimensional case, this is a value, a real value. This real value is equal to a constant. Here, I have a function, replace this constant by a function. This function, this constant is not random, is unknown, but not random. So you have a function which is not random. What is the role of this function? It describes the overall shape of the, of the, of the process, like in the one-dimensional case. Then, you need the main factors. The main factors are additional constants you introduce in the one-dimensional case. Here you need additional functions. And then the interaction. And then you know that this doesn't, describe, doesn't determine those equations, doesn't determine the model. You need to introduce some linear constraints, and the linear constraints are here. So we are exactly in the same situation as in the real case, excepting that constants has been replaced by functions. But the situation is exactly the same. Very good. What about the epsilons? The epsilons are, are the random errors. They are centered, and inside each cell, they are identically distributed. Very good. Now, what are your tests? You are interested in the two factor case. You are interested in testing if the, the first factor has some effect, the second factor has some effect, and if there are interaction or not. How do you test it? Uh, the sum of the, cons uh, of the functions is zero. If the first factor has no effect, if those functions are always the same, always the same, the sum is zero, so all of them should be zero and the same. This is what you have to test. How do you test it? Very simple. Very simple. Instead, testing, sorry, instead testing if this function is zero, test if a randomly chosen projection is zero, and this is real. And you can apply every one-dimensional ANOVA procedure you want. 
this is the, the proof. This is the proof. This is the complex proof. The, the complex proof is uh, <laughs> sad. In Spanish, we say one thing is sad when the head is no interest in it. This is the full proof. This is triste. And uh, very good. Now, let's go to, to practice. How does the procedure work then? Remember, we are testing, the, for instance, we are focusing that, that our attention in the first factor. We want to test if all those functions are zero. We select a vector at random. And we replace this null hypothesis by this one. This is the projection of this function, the projection of this function. Very good. You know, I hope you know, I am talking for one, half an hour now, you know that with probability one, those hypotheses are equivalent, so uh, in practical terms, they are completely equivalent. Very good. Then, you have some data. Next step is to project your data using the same vector every time. This vector V you have. And once you have those are real, real numbers, and then you can apply a one-dimensional ANOVA analysis to test this hypothesis. And that's it. That's it. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Every student knows that uh, ANOVA doesn't work if the, if the data are not almost elastic. What happens if the data, the functions are functions, this is complicated. If the functions are heteroselastic, what are you going to do? We are lost. No, no. All you only need to look for a one-dimensional analysis of variance which works for heterosedastic data, and that's it. You have hundreds. Of course, uh, if the data are not Gaussian, are you in trouble? No. You only need to look for a NOVA, a NOVA analysis valid for non-Gaussian data. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We are here talking about uh, only two-dimensional, two factors. What happens if there are covariable? Nothing. Project, and you only need to have a one-dimensional ANOVA working for covariables. But, but, but you, are, you are very clever. You can imagine some other thing I haven't thought it. What happens if I don't know? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> well, unless if there is a one-dimensional ANOVA allowing to handle, I don't know. Ah, <laughs> you got me now. <laughs> if you are able to think something, we have no one-dimensional ANOVA, what am I going to do? As you start solving this problem in the one-dimensional case before to ask me to solve the same problem in the functional case. You don't know the answer in the one-dimensional case and you are pretending I know the answer in the functional case. I'm open, Gaia. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is the situation. And then I've given you a procedure. This is what I told you. This procedure is simple because it transformed. Just take a projection. It's simple to compute a, a direction, project, we are, this is simple, this part is simple. Then project, easy to compute, we are in the one-dimensional case, in the one-dimensional case you have millions of procedures, well, perhaps not millions, but tens of thousands of procedures, so, what is the price? Something is wrong here. What is wrong? I told you. What is wrong is you, are, you, you have a full function and you have taken one number. You have lost information. This is obvious. If you lose information, you should lose power. And, and this is the price you are paying. How can you improve your loss of power? One possibility is instead taken, in, in, in probability theory, one direction is enough. And if your sample is big enough, I mean in probability terms, so you have unfinite data, then one projection is enough. But in reality, it doesn't happen. You are losing power. What can you do? Take more than one direction, apply the ANOVA to each corresponding null hypothesis, and base the decision on the result of the k-test. Okay? Here you are replacing a full function by k values, randomly chosen. So, I don't know. Okay. So, this is what I told you before. How can you make your decision with k values? A simple possibility. A simple possibility is to compute the k pay values, take the minimum, and then you need to introduce some correction because you are handling, you are not taking one value but the minimum of k. Which correction? Bonferroni, this is your first idea. But Bonferroni is too conservative. I don't like Bonferroni. In fact, I like Bonferroni, but the referee didn't, and then I had to look for another <laughs> one. 
is here the referee <laughs> to thank him because I, 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 we need to, to think a bit more and then we, we improve the procedure. And then you can use bootstrap, but bootstrap is too time consuming. And then we learn about the false discovery rate. What is the false discovery rate? Probably most of you know, but the false discovery rate is the expected proportion of erroneous rejection when testing k null hypothesis. The expected proportion of erroneous rejections. Here I have k null hypothesis, so I can apply the, the false discovery rate with a big advantage. The false discovery rate is the expected proportion. How many uh, null hypotheses do I have? K. No, just one, because all of them are equivalent. Okay, so what is the expected? <laughs> She was asleep and I awake at her. And then she, she felt. <laughs> and then, what happens? This is the same at the level of the case. Because I, the expected number, I only have one. So this is the level of the test. Very good. And then we apply the procedure proposed by Benjamin J. Kuteli in 2001, which follows the following step. First, sort the p-value you obtain it. And then, reject the new hypothesis if this set is not empty. What does this mean? Good. Take the minimum. See if the minimum is less or equal than 1, k, alpha over k. This is Bonferroni correction. So if Bonferroni rejects, I also reject. Assume Bonferroni doesn't reject. Then I move to the second. I take the second twice this quantity. If I reject, that's it. If not, go to the third. Take the third three times this quantity. And that's it. This result only holds if the tests are positively dependent. Notice that this, those tests, we haven't proved this, but it seems obvious. They are positively dependent. Why? Because they are based in the same data set. If I obtain a big p-value in this data set, then probably I will obtain a, a, an i p-value in the next trial. Okay? But it doesn't matter. You don't need to bother with this because this result is general if you introduce here this term. Very good. This is the theory. Now let's go to practice. Uh, now the, we have taken this, uh, this analysis from a paper by Antoniadis and Zapatinas. Uh, it takes, uh, talks about how do individuals cope with a perturbation while sleeping in place. In this study, they found seven guys uh, and they accepted to, uh, to use a spring loaded orthosis and then they used the following experimental condition. Without no, with the control group with orthosis, and then they added two springs in the, in the orthosis to see what happened. Each, uh, each individual uh, did 10 trials, 20 seconds each one. They were missed along the time. Very good. I told you that this data, this, the, this, uh, data were analyzed at first by Antoniadis and Sapatinas in 2007. And here we have con considered uh, a two-factor analysis, uh, subjects and treatments considered a factor, and we have 10 observations per cell. Very good. Here you have the number of random projections we have taken, 5, 15, 30. Here you have the p-values we obtain for the existence of effect of the subject of this, of this factor, of this factor and the interaction. Zero every time, so we reject. Then, in this paper, they were interested in analyzing the existence of difference between wearing a spring or uh, having one of those conditions. The p-value in the paper was zero, and the p-value in our case is also zero. Then, analyze the, the existence of difference between the control and the orthosis group. The p-value in the paper was 0.001, and we obtained it far lower p-values than there. And then the existence of difference between different springs. The p-value was 0.02, and we, when, with only five random projections, we obtain this, this p-value, but then the power increases to obtain a value which is relatively similar to the p-value in Antoniedis and Zapatinas. Here you have what happened if using Bonferroni correction, then the, uh, here is more or less similar than before. I'm sorry. ¿Qué pasó? Aquí. Uh, a bit better for the, for the Bonferroni, but uh, you don't have an increment on the power uh, when taking more, more random projections. 
Here I have an example in which uh, you have a covariable, but uh, I think I am a bit short of time, so I won't speak this. You can imagine how is this, only taking uh, linear projections. And go to the second problem. I think you will enjoy this problem, I hope. What is this problem? You know that to test whether a distribution is Gaussian or not is important in the statistics. Okay. There are not so many tests in, in the finite dimensional case to test whether a distribution is Gaussian or not. It happens that we have been able to prove a probability result stating that exactly the same as before. You have a distribution in a functional space, but this includes finite dimensional space also. You have a random function, a distribution of functions. You want to know if this distribution is Gaussian or not. And then you consider the set of vectors of directions in the space such that this marginal is Gaussian. The main result is exactly the same as before. If your distribution is Gaussian, then of course every marginal is Gaussian. But if your distribution is not Gaussian, then there are very few directions in which your distribution is Gaussian. How many? Very, very few, practically no one. In other words, if a random reduction projection is Gaussian, then the distribution is Gaussian. Very good. Now, uh, how, this is to awake someone. Then, now, uh, the, uh, how, uh, you, you are in the finite dimensional case. How can you check if your distribution is Gaussian? Employing projection pursuit method. Looking for, uh, looking for every direction. To find, at the end, you find one in which your data is not Gaussian. It is interesting to compare how projection pursuit work with, take this, take two, take three, take three, okay, at random. And this is what I, I am going to do now. And then this is projection pursuit, this is what I am telling you, 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 take, you consider all the projections, all possible projections, trying to find one in which your data are not, are not Gaussian, and then the distribution is not Gaussian, okay. Now, in both cases, you, you translate the problem to test uh, one-dimensional normality. Here we have taken the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test. Perhaps this is not the more powerful one, but it happens that this was the used in this paper. And anyway, if, if we are going to use the same with projection pursuit and in random projections. This paper was published in Journal of Multivariate Analysis in 2005, and the authors handled dimension two. Why? because there are a lot of possible directions, even in R2, perhaps you can compute, of course you can compute pro, uh, projection pursuit in R2, perhaps in R3, 4, but not 5 or 6, or tell something about 50. And then, we are in dimension 2, we have two candidates, and now I have a standard normal distribution, and then I have a mixture of a standard normal distribution with some other thing. And here I can, I can take me, uh, M, the mean, two values, this, the same as here, or three, three, and sigma is the covariance matrix, which can be the identity, the same as before, or this one, in which the marginals are highly correlated. And here you have, uh, I have followed the, res the study by uh, Sekeli and Rizzo, and here you have in light green, the winner, in green, the winner in every situation. You have here the sample sizes, the winner in every situation. If it is light, this is because the difference is more than 15%, if I remember. If it is dark green, the difference is less than 15. What, what do you see? We have won, with taking one marginal, we never won. But taking more than one, not too many, 10, we won several times to the projection pursuit method. And uh, in a, of course, you, you can see some patterns when the, vari the variance Sorry. We, here you have the mixture. This is the covariance of the second part of the mixture. When the covariance is the, not the quite correlated, then projection pursuit used to win. But in this case, the projection, the, sorry, not the projection pursuit, our method used to win. Probably this is due to the way in which we take the projections at random, uh, taken uniformly. We have been able to construct a normality test for stationary processes. 
uh, this is an interesting problem. You know that the, uh, the, uh, there are laws of, of tests for stationarity, for, no, for normality of stationary processes, but it happens that motors then only check the normality of one dimensional marginal, perhaps two, two dimensional marginals. Here, I'm going to present you a simple, wonderful test <laughs> to test the joint mar normality. How? Very simple. You have a sample, which is a trajectory of a quite long, perhaps, of a stationary process, only one trajectory. Very good. Then, take the vector at random, and finite components at random. Very good. With, uh, for instance, marginal, normal marginal, I don't know. And then make this computation you have here. Take y equal to 1. In this case, a equal to 1. Then I take the history of the process, starting in 1, till the very beginning times v. This is y1. Then move to 2. I start here. The first term here was 1 minus 0, x1. When y is 2, I have 2 minus 0, x2. I start in x2. <laughs> Sorry. I start in x2, <laughs> uh, looking behind. Okay? And then I am constructing this. What are the properties of y? The properties of y are, first, it is obvious that why i is stationary, because this process is stationary. The transformation is always the same, because I have selected just one random vector. Very good. And the wonderful property. What happens? If those are not jointly Gaussian, according to our previous procedure, this vector, which is one-dimensional, is not one-dimensional Gaussian. Okay? If the, those are not jointly Gaussian, then this is not Gaussian. Therefore, the joint normality of this process has translated in the one-dimensional Gaussianity of this process. Now it happens that I have a stationary processes that under the alternative is not Gaussian, it has no one-dimensional marginals. I, I have a lot of tests to check the normality of one-dimensional marginals. Wonderful. Wonderful, this is what uh, we can do. In fact, uh, this, this part, the proof of this part is not very easy. The difficult part is to find condition on X which translate to Y in order to apply the, those tests I am talking to you about here. Very good. Uh, we have selected two tests. Two tests to say something if you want, if you prefer some other, one, some other, then we can use other, don't worry. And then this is the EPS test, this is a classical test which is based in empirical characteristic function, the comparison of the empirical characteristic function for one dimensional marginal, of course, with the corresponding one for the normal distribution. And then this test, which is a skeunosis kurtosis test. Very good. Which one choose? In our case, which one is better? Which one can we choose? This is a difficult problem for mathematicians. Which is the optimal one? What, what can I decide? Don't worry, we can use both. How? Yes, remember, we are not applying the, the test once. We are applying the test several times. So in the, in the simulations I'm going to present you, we apply the test four times. So two times for the EPS test and two times for the Lovato and Velasco test. You have more tests. Don't worry. Instead of taking four, pro, four random projections, I take six, two for the new, your new test. Doesn't matter. Uh, that's it. Here you have the, the, the scheme. You have uh, this, this process in which the, the innovation are those whose distribution are those in the new hypothesis and then some alternatives. The values of Q I am taking here are those. And you have the results. You see that sometimes you obtain I powers. This should be 0.05 and this is 0.07, even 0.11. Usually, this is the value of the, of the random projection test with k equal to 4. Usually, this value is closest to the highest than, than to the lower. And very good. This is what you expected. Something in between. Very good. Uh, I am obtaining very strange. We have obtained a very strange thing. Look at those points here. The power, when, when using those tests, Remember, yes, I am the beta 2, 1, one dimensional marginal. So this test should have detected it. But the power is very low. Look at the power of the, of the, of the random projection test. A much higher project pot power than those tests. Why? 
Why? What is the difference between this case and this case? The, different, the only difference is the value of Q. The value of Q is related to the dependence between xt, xt and xt minus 1. Q equal to 0 0.9, 0 0.9 means this dependence is very strong. However, if I take projections, then the dependence structure change. And the new dependence structure makes easier to detect the non-normality of the, of the marginal we have. Very good. This was better than we expected. Here you have another situation in which the, the joint marginals are not... Uh, are not uh, And then, uh, este, I need to do everything. <laughs> and then uh, you have here one dimensional marginal, normal, but not two, two dimensional. And here you hear that those tests has nothing to do. And even the power decreases when the sample size increases. And you have here the random projection test whose power increases with the sample size and the number of components of the number of projections. And of course, you expect, uh, of course, you told about the uh, simulations. I mean, what happens with real data? Real data you have here, two, two, two data sets. These are related to Canadian lynxes. And this is sunspot uh, data. You have the p-values here. Do, do, uh, those data were not analyzed by Lobato Velasco, but they were used by IPSTES. Very good. And you say, what? So you are, you are, going, you are giving nothing new in the, in the real case. That's fine. White. We have also analyzed the, the, the flow drops in the Nile River data, in the Nile River, in this period in which it is assumed to be stationary. And then it happens that the EPS test and the Lobato and Velasco test doesn't detect that the, the flows are not normal. But we find very clearly that they are not normal. What happens here? The marginal, the one dimensional marginal is normal. But the joint distribution is not normal. Okay, probably this is related to you have in this period you have a dam to the, the they construct a first dam in Aswan, and then in seventy they uh, started with the second dam, and perhaps they regulate it some way which makes that uh, the marginal are one dimensional normal, but not the joint distribution. We expect something similar in the case of the height of the waves. And the last application, uh, I, I wasn't too interested in to get the, this point because this research is in progress and the paper is not, and not, and not yet ready. But it is related to something I have heard, some interesting thing I have heard this morning and then I, I want to, to talk something about this. Here we return to a, a real uh, functional problem in which we have the wavelengths, the fat content. I am interested in detect the fat content of the meat looking at this curve. Very good. Then I have, this is the fat content, which is real. This is the absorbent curve. And I am interested in this model. I am interested in predict the fat content looking at the curve. So I'm looking for a function, define it on the functions, getting to, uh, going to R, which, in which this model holds. Very good. People is very often is interested in the linear model. Why the linear model? Because it's the simplest one. What is the, simple, the linear model here? I need, a, I need a, function, a function such that this happens. What does our method tell here? Our method tells here what you can expect. It happens that this expectation is equal to zero, almost surely, if this, uh, this, this theorem is not too easy to be proved, but uh, I don't expect the Phil medal to prove it, but uh, neither, but uh, it is a, a half of difficulty. And then it happens that this is equal to zero almost surely if and only if the expectation of y given this scalar product is zero. Here, this is something functional in which a function is involved. Here, I only have real numbers. So I have transformed this, this problem in this one. And then you, you have the same. The new hypothesis is that uh, this conditional expectation is zero. Come, uh, sorry, I am interested in testing this conditional expectation is zero. So I am in the linear model and the value. I am, sorry. 
I am in the linear model, and it happens that this is zero. This is, the, this is a simple new hypothesis, and it can be checked with this. But I have this advantage, of course. But we have been able also to prove the corresponding result for the composite model, the composite new hypothesis. I am interested now in testing this model, not in this is zero, but if this holds or not. Then applying the previous result, it happens that this new hypothesis holds for some value here if it's equivalent to test this new hypothesis. I mean, if this happens, then this happens. And if this doesn't happen, with, pro with probability one, this neither happens. And here you only have uh, real random variables involved. And then perhaps this is too technical. Here you have, I have two kinds of people. People familiar with this problem, then they know what I am talking about. And people which is not too familiar with this problem, we, uh, we expect uh, they are going to understand nothing in a, a couple of minutes, so I will skip the details. And then we have handled the same statistic uh, uh, by a student in 97, which is related to linear regression between real quantities. And it happens that the statistic we are handling is this, in which we have an estimator of the real quantity, and we have been able to prove that this statistic is equivalent to this one plus something which is goes to zero. And this statistic, we have the difference between your estimator and the real value of the parameter times a constant. This is a function, but a constant. This term is not random. So the behavior of our test is directly related to the behavior of this difference. Uh, and according to the paper by Cardo et al. in 2007, it seems that the speed of conversion of this should be this. We have, we have advanced a bit, and, but we are in this point. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. In reality, the results that follow confirm what any statistician would feel that, okay, this is a probabilistic result, but in reality, we don't have the, the two probabilities, we only estimate them, but in some sense, we'd be close, not far, but close. So in reality, the probability mu of the directions will, which will not show us that we are not the same is not zero, it's positive in, in, in general. So that's why the number of projections you take should depend on the sample size. More, more data you have, probably less the directions you have to take, and uh, vice versa. So this was a, only a comment, just to, because on one sense, it, on one hand, uh, it is a probabilistic result, which of course the probability is zero, but you don't have the probability. You have some error to estimate them, but then you have a set of directions that are of positive measures. You are completely right. And then, <clears throat> and then we have some simulations in the appendix in, in which we analyze what is, is this going to be complicated because uh, it was ready to get and I don't know what. And then we analyze what is the relationship between the number of directions and where your planning depends, decreases with the sample size, and increases with the dimension of the space. But broadly speaking, in every problem we have handled, okay. 200, 205, my, my second comment was on the very last slides because I'm working on that too. And uh, uh, the last time you said uh, you put with with this student test statistics that is driven by the by the, uh, the behavior of, uh, of of your estimator. Yeah, in some sense, it's a bit disappointing that um, the test statistic is driven by the behavior of uh, of the estimator in the model. Because it is what will happen, in fact. In the, the, in the model, okay. Yes, yeah, so the way you are estimating rho zero will completely driven your test statistic. 
And at some point, this is a bit disappointing. And quite little, as far as I know, maybe maybe a bit of more than that, because we've thought his work. Uh, as far as I know, the behavior of rho hat minus rho zero, it's a very complicated behavior in functional setup. And, uh, well. You're right, but uh, because it, it depends in uh, some way on the, what is the dimension of this set in the, in the space that there might yeah. be. Yeah. But uh, we are, this result was proven last week, not last week, not, but 10 days ago. It seems that uh, in this paper you have a complete casuistic in which you have it, it's happened, it, it is high in the proof, it is appear a constant called TN uh, rho, it is the case, but it seems, we are, I am practical in zero, that we are only in the worst case. We only need to handle here the worst case, the worst possibility. This is the reason I write here ESN. In that paper appear two kinds of constant, SN, which is independent, of not, it depends on nothing, and TN rho. And I, 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 uh, I have a, a strong commitment that the expectation, this expectation, the case, uh, uh, always fall in the set of points uh, which are like S and under some regularity condition for the singer to the condition of having a particular value. The other way around would be to smooth out this. What about the picture? It happens that I was working on this picture for two or three hours. And <laughs> 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 I stopped it. And then I have a thing to recognize this picture, say no. <laughs> Nobody knows what this is here, what is the picture taken. This is the bridge. <laughs> it is the bridge with this church here. And I was working for a couple of hours because this picture wasn't good enough because it is, it is so located and then I was looking in the internet and working. <laughs> I felt really disappointed. This is the worst story that I've ever had in my life.